Hi everyone, I'm Whitney Weibel, and I want to thank you for joining me today as I present my research looking at vermicomposting municipal biosolids prior to land application to remove triclosan and methyltriclosan. So humans create a lot of sewage waste, on average 8 million dry tons a year in the U.S. alone, and more than half is applied to land for restoration, forestry, and agricultural practices, while the rest is sent to landfills or incinerated. This is a very simplified diagram of the wastewater treatment process. Incoming wastewater is treated in the digestion tank and pumped into settling tanks where the solids sink to the bottom and are pumped out for use or disposal while the treated wastewater is typically discharged into nearby body of water. The treated solid end product is called biosolids. Biosolids are high in nutrients and therefore are ideal for amending or improving soil and offer a great alternative to chemical or synthetic fertilizers. Regulations of biosolids focuses on the removal of pathogens and industrial waste and does not include pharmaceuticals or personal care products. Triclosan kills bacteria, fungi, and viruses and has been used extensively for the last 40 years. It is found in many household personal care products such as soaps, toothpastes, cosmetics, and even plastics and clothing. Methotriclosan is the degraded form of triclosan and has been shown to persist longer in the environment and is more lipophilic or bioaccumulative by organisms. Researchers have found triclosan, methotriclosan, as well as other contaminants in the tissue of earthworms collected from land where biosolids had been previously applied. Some wastewater treatment plants have even begun to use earthworms to process raw sewage sludge. So here's the thing about triclosan. It's considered an endocrine disruptor, meaning it interferes with the hormonal system and can potentially cause detrimental mutations to various species, including humans. Applying biosolids to land is potentially introducing chemical contaminants to the environment. And in 2017, FDA did ban triclosan from antibacterial soaps as they are considered over-the-counter drugs under the FDA regulations but the agency has different regulatory power over cosmetics, lotions, and gels, which can use triclosan as a preservative. And these products are not required to have FDA approval before being marketed and sold. Researchers have determined that there is no way to remove all personal care products and pharmaceuticals like with the current wastewater treatment processes, even with additional treatments like filters, ozonation, UV or chemical additions. And since triclosan is hydrophobic, it settles in with the biosolids. So I wanted to know if there was a way to remove triclosan and methotriclosan from the biosolids prior to land application using earthworms. Past research has shown worms have the ability to bioaccumulate various toxins, including triclosan. And worms have are already being used to process human waste, so we know they're capable of surviving in and processing the substrate. But to my knowledge, no one has evaluated the use of earthworms for the distinct purpose of removing contaminants from biosolids prior to land application. So my research consisted of a lot of trials and error to find a way to make biosolids suitable for earthworm survival. And I'm happy to share that information to interested parties. But today, I really want to focus on the tiny last part of my research that I found most interesting and hope to get some of you excited about as well. But first, one more thing about wastewater treatment. I'm going to be using the term digestion, and that is the process by which the sludge is treated. Aerobic digestion is where oxygen is pumped into the sludge to encourage microbes to break down pathogens and contaminants, while anaerobic digestion is the same process, but in an environment without oxygen. For my research, biosolids were collected from three wastewater treatment plants, each utilizing a different method of digestion to process their incoming sewage. For each biosolid source, I made a substrate that was divided amongst two containers. One received earthworms and the other was left to age as a control without earthworms. And that would allow us to see what happens in the absence of earthworms. 
the City of Tacoma's Environmental Services Lab analyzed my samples for triclosan and methyltriclosan concentrations. I developed a fairly straightforward recipe. You simply mix by hand four parts biosolids, three parts paper mulch as the carbon supplement. Add enough water to reach 80% moisture and add 1.6 kilograms of worms per square meter. Allow it to age for 35 days and then sample. So I hypothesized I would see the lowest concentrations of the substrate exposed to earthworms compared to the control substrate. I also expected to see the lowest methyltriclosan concentrations in the substrate exposed to earthworms compared to the control. My results indicate the triclosan appeared to decrease in the presence of earthworms, but let's take a closer look at what I found. In this figure, I've presented the triclosan concentrations for the three digestion processes, before in blue, the control in red, and after worm exposure in green. Again, the control is simply the aged substrate without worms. And it looks as though there was a decrease in triclosan concentrations in the substrate exposed to worms for, the two, for two of the biosolid sources. But look at the results for the Tacoma in the middle. We see the concentration in Tacoma's control is higher than the before substrate. And since triclosan is a synthetic compound and is not naturally occurring, this discrepancy is believed to be due to variations in the GCMS's calibrations, and the lab does allow for 20% uncertainty in soil samples. So if we add the 20% instrument uncertainty and take into consideration there are no replicates in my study, I cannot make a conclusive statement of certainty. Also, the concentration of triclosan is in the many thousands of micrograms per kilogram, so small differences would be hard to observe without replicates. My hypothesis that the lowest methyltriclosan concentrations would be observed in the presence of earthworms was not supported by my findings. Again, this figure shows methyltriclosan concentrations in the substrate before the control and after worms. But please take note that the y-axis only goes to 200 micrograms per kilogram, as opposed to the triclosan figure where the y-axis went to 7,000 micrograms per kilogram. So in the biosolids aerobically digested on the left, we see a decrease in methyltriclosan concentrations as I had hypothesized, more so in the substrate exposed to earthworms. But what I found terribly interesting, interesting and I'm most excited to share with you today is that it appears that methyltriclosan concentrations in the other two biosolids increased with the earthworms presence, more so than in the control. But with the 20% uncertainty, only the Tacoma substrate in the middle has a measurable difference in concentration. So let's take a closer look at the Tacoma biosolids because these are the results that I am super excited about. First, the triclosan concentrations. As we saw before, there isn't much measurable difference between the substrates before and after, whether we aged it with or without earthworms. But when we look at the methyl triclosan concentrations, the increase is stark. And on this figure, I've included the values for number people. So having worms present um, increased the amount of methyltriclosan from the initial concentration 32 times. Whereas just allowing the substrate to age without earthworms, the concentration increased not quite 12 times from the starting amount. So what's going on? Did the earthworms bioaccumulate the contaminants? The only way to confirm this is to test the worms, which I didn't get to do due to funding limitations, but past research has, so it is possible. However, I, what I found most interesting is that the methotriclosan concentrations increased more when the earthworms were present in this coma substrate compared to control, but why? I think a bit of anatomy might help us understand what's going on. So this is a worm, this is its head, this is the other end, and this is where the magic happens. And I believe the magic is microbes that are fostered in the guts of earthworms. See, earthworms eat microbes in the soil and excrete others in their feces. What's so cool is that, say a worm eats 10 microbes, they'll excrete five. Those five are as active as the 10 previously consumed. 
So I think the observed increase in methyltriclosan concentrations is due to the supercharged microbes that are excreted in earthworm feces, which perhaps more rapidly degrades the triclosan into methyltriclosan. That's just my personal theory. And since methyltriclosan is more lipophilic, it can then be more easily bioaccumulated by the earthworms, which I hypothesize may be the case had the worms been allowed more time to process the biosolid substrate. So we know that pharmaceuticals are entering the wastewater treatment plants and current technology is not 100% effective. While the FDA has banned triclosan in some products, it does not have the regulatory power over all consumer products containing triclosan. And the long-term effects of triclosan on and in the environment and wildlife are unknown. So it's too late for the precautionary principle. But perhaps earthworms may be able to help mediate this issue we've started. Before I wrap up, there are a few acknowledgements primarily the city of Tacoma for their generous contribution of lab analyses and method development. And with that, I have to say thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, this is my email address. And I greatly look forward to hearing some of your questions now. <laughs>